Provost, Vice Provost, Associate Provost, Director of CDTL, and fellow educators. Welcome to the 2009 Outstanding Educator Public Lectures. Now, before we proceed with the lectures, please allow me to add my congratulations to all the winners. I salute you, well done, and it's truly a pleasure to celebrate your achievement. And the pleasure remains undim, although this is, I think, the eighth, ninth, ninth time that I've been at a university um, teaching award ceremony. I've been at everyone since its inception in 2000. But as I say, I can honestly say that the pleasure of witnessing the recognition and honoring of the deserving is truly gratifying. And this morning, we have two colleagues who have been deservedly recognized as outstanding educator. First, in alphabetical order, is Go Sei Song. Sei Song is an associate professor and assistant head at the Department of Mathematics. He's also the director of the Center for Wavelet Approximation and Information Processing. Sei Song earned his BA honors at Oxford and then proceeded to take his master's and PhD at Michigan Ann Arbor. Upon successful completion of both, he joined NUS and the Department of Mathematics in 1994, if I'm correct. And uh, since then, apart from keeping up with his research, he's also been busily garnering multiple teaching awards, both at faculty and university level. Now, among his many achievements are his very successful efforts at seducing students. Don't get worried. <laughs> I was only going to say that you were very successful at persuading students that mathematics can be enjoyable, even for the non-nerds. Uh, sorry, I mean for the non-math geniuses. <laughs> well, Seisong is certainly passionate about advancing the cause of uh, mathematics education, and he has been very active in outreach programs at the schools and junior colleges. And in so doing, I'm sure he's raised the profile of his discipline as well as his department. Now, I might mention here that the Department of Mathematics is one department who has the largest number of OEA winners. Right? And I think the department should be very proud of that fact. It's produced three outstanding educators and, of course, also a provost. <laughs> In fact, I think two provosts, because Prof Chong is also uh, uh, from the mathematics department. Maybe it's time to seriously consider an outstanding department award. <laughs> but before I get off track, let me get back onto the agenda by inviting outstanding educator, associate professor Go Sei Song to share with us his ideas on our role as educators in university education. Sei Song, please. Thank you, Daphne, for the very nice introduction. I was very worried when you start to say that, you know, seducing the student. Uh, my wife is going to give me a hard time tonight. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, good morning to all of you, and uh, I'm very thankful to the university and to the uh, University Teaching Excellence Committee for giving me the opportunity to speak here this morning to so many colleagues, so many excellent teachers, and, uh, and for the teaching award. And uh, I would also like to thank the Faculty Teaching Excellence Committee and the Head and Deputy Head in Teaching of the Department of Mathematics for the nomination of this award. And last but not least, I really like to say thank you to all the dedicated teachers from the Department of Mathematics that I have the nice opportunity of working together with and learning with them about the various activities in teaching, may it be promoting teaching excellence in the Department of Mathematics, or outreach activities to educate the nation about the applications of mathematics, or teaching courses together. That is very useful for me because I get to learn a lot of new tricks about teaching. 
So today I'm going to tell, talk a little bit something slightly different, and I'm going to talk about instead of teaching methods, I'll talk about some talks, some talks of my thoughts about our roles as educators in the university. Now I'm sure many of you have your own ideas about this, so what I'll present today is actually my personal opinion about our roles as educators in the universities. So therefore, what you hear today would be my opinion, and it does not represent the opinion of my employer, my faculty, <laughs> or my department. <laughs> okay, so let's get the ball rolling. And to start off with, I'm sure that some of you know, and I hope all of you know, what is our NUS mission. So before I came, before I prepared this talk, I take a look, from time to time, I look at our mission of the university because I think the mission is very well written and it's very concise and precise, exactly like what mathematician likes in a few words. Transformative education about the way that people think and do things through three areas, teaching, research, and service. And if you look further into the mission, you will actually notice that there are three elaborations about the three areas. So I'm going to indicate and highlight to you two of those, the elaboration about education and what it elaborates about service. Now for education, there's this keyword that I was really excited to see, transformative education. How are we going to transform our student? That's the first thing. And for service, there's another part that something that holds dearly to my heart and that is Dedicated service for national development. We are the National University of Singapore. So what we should do and what we hope that we will do, we will contribute towards the national development through our educational effort. So if we have this in mind, then we will have an idea about what are the roles in education. Now, as a mathematician, I will classify things as category A, category B. Category A means the formal roles, the official roles. Then category B, that means the informal roles or the other roles. And what are the possible roles that we can have under here? Any takers? Now, let me take the easy way out. What are the things that we should do in the university? Teaching, research, and service. So the official role will be, will be educator. We can be a researcher and we can be an administrator, administrator that contributes towards education. So these are some formal roles. And many of us feel that, you know, you teach a lecture, the students should be entertained. Maybe we should be entertainer. But this morning, Wang Hoon has just disputed that this is not going to work. Our student wants to be educated, but they do not. They do not need to be a full-time entertainer. So maybe we can go for something that is slightly in between you educate and you entertain at the same time. Maybe you can be an educator. Perhaps. That is one possibility. And then you say, after all, it's all about learning knowledge. So we can play the role as a knowledge builder. We build the knowledge. We want to challenge our students. We want to bring out the full potential of our students so we can have things like challenge provider. Then on the other hand, we as a research university, we can actually provide lots of research opportunities for the student. We can be a research mentor. And being a research mentor, you can facilitate knowledge. You can facilitate the invention of knowledge. And like I say, I hope that we can contribute towards national development. So we should be a good role model. Role model as, as an educator for the students and some of uh, as we we'll say, what else can we do? Maybe we can be motivational speaker there. But, well, you can do that, but we should take one step further. We can go for something like an inspirational teacher. You inspire your student in all aspects. Inspire the students to be interested in education, inspire the students to be interested in learning, to bring out the potential. So these are some of the possible roles that we can have in education. And that brings me to the outline of my talk. And I would like to be simple, and I'll concentrate on issues and challenges about how we can carry out our roles as educators in the universities. And 
I would like to share with you some of my personal experience, some of the methods I have used, the strategies and ideas to carry out my role as an educator in the university, and I'll conclude to think a little bit and to reflect a little bit about how I spent the last 15 years of my life in the university. So that is my plan for today. Okay, there are many questions that we can ask as with regards to the roles of our, as an educator. Now, to say the least, we should provide students with knowledge. We should provide students with the fundamental knowledge. So how are we going to provide that? Now, this is the dangerous path in the sense that sometimes we are so obsessed about providing this solid knowledge until the stage that it becomes, you know, teaching a lot of materials. This is something that we should think about. And ultimately, you want our students to be more active in learning. Very often, due to the structure, due to their education experience, it turns out that very, very often our students do not participate as actively as they should. So how can we encourage them to be active learners? And at the end of the day, we want to train them so that they can actually move on either further studies or to learn new things after their graduation. How do we inculcate the ability for further and independent learning? These are some of the issues that we can actually address. Other issues, these are some of the more practical issues. Practical issues as in, since we are a big university, we have so many students. It's inevitable that we have very good students, we have some students which are weaker. So the question is, how are you going to accommodate both? Should you only concentrate on the good students or should you actually try to inspire both the good students and the weak students? So this is one question and this brings us to how are we going to challenge all students effectively? I've highlighted two keywords. First one, effectively. Second one, all. Why do I indicate the word challenge effectively? Because in order to challenge the students, there are many things you can do. You can always teach at a level that is much higher than they can absorb. You can definitely challenge them. But is this really effective? Because some students may just get blown away completely. So the issue is that how do you challenge them effectively? And do you want to just challenge the good students? Or do you think that actually the average students also deserve to be challenged and can be challenged? Because at the end of the day, what we want is we want to bring out the full potential of the student. Different students have different strengths and they have different potentials. And to me, as long as we can bring out their full potential, that is good enough. And there are many challenges and difficulties. And this is an uphill task. Because, like I say, we have students of different attitudes. Very strong students, average students. And very often in Asian universities, this is quite common. The syllabus is very packed. Like in, and very often I, I was assigned to teach a course, I look at the syllabus, and then I realized that this is really a lot of material. Packed syllabus, tight schedule. What are we going to do? A-level mindset of students. What is A-level mindset? Now, uh, I, I learned last week from the Faculty of Science teaching uh, workshop that nowadays, the JC students, when they study, they always go for TYS. What is TYS? Now, I, I was taken aback because I'm supposed to grow up from this education system. I do not know what is TYS. Then I finally realized that TYS stands for 10-year series. So it was exactly what we had even in the student days. Now, this is very common that many students, when they want to study for a topic, they look at the past year exam paper. They look at the past year, past year is not enough, past years, past 10 years. And when I was the JC student in the 80s, 10 years means to the 70s, and I, I, I still didn't have enough. I look at the past up to the 60s, you know, the past exam question. Now, this kind of idea, unfortunately, is not the best approach about learning. So, A-level mindset, somehow, we need to change. And 
there is a pre-university gap. Now, this is something that is inherent from our local education structure because for the girls, before they come to the university, after the A-levels, there's a gap of nine months. For the boys, it's actually two years and nine months. Many things that you can actually forget after this long gap. And there's another gap, not just in time, but in standard. There's a big jump between the A-level stand a syllabus and the university syllabus. That is another issue that we should consider. And being a big university, at the lower level modules, I'm going to have many, many big classes. How are you going to facilitate uh, interaction in these big classes? So these are some of the issues that we need to face. And furthermore, there are a lot of modern developments. Modern developments that uh, has come about due to the advancement in technology. Now, once upon a time, I remember that in my, in fact, in my undergraduate and graduate school, the way that I learned mathematics is the blackboard. And when I came to NUS in 1994, I realized that there's a big advancement. We don't use blackboard anymore. We use the whiteboard. <laughs> and one of my colleagues even told me that, you know, here we are more advanced, more high-tech. We use the transparency to conduct lectures. That was in 94. And nevertheless, whether it's whiteboard, blackboard, they, they are all boards. And this is what we call the old school way of teaching mathematics. And suddenly, at the, towards the end of the 90s, big advancement in technology, internet, computer, tablet PC, all this comes about. And so the question is, how are we going to incorporate modern technology that technological developments into the old school way of learning. Now, should we just eliminate the old school way completely or should we try to get what is good in the old school ways and then try to combine them together and put it together and try to utilize all these advances in technology? And I went to two universities for my undergraduate and graduate school. The total number of years of heritage of these two universities is about 1,000 years. I'm sure there are some good that we can get out from the old school way. So the question is, what are we going to do? And last but not least, like I said, we want to contribute towards national development. So maybe we should look at the picture of what I call the education ecosystem of Singapore. We are here as university educators. Our main contact, our students in the system, which is university students. And you may say that there are maybe two other parties to simplify the picture under this ecosystem. They are the school teachers, the school students. And what we do is that we educate the university student. As part of the contributions towards the nation, we offer certain workshops to the school teachers to bring them to their attention some of the latest development in research, Sometimes we go down to the school to inspire the school students. This is our rounds of interaction. And at the end of the day, many of our university students, after they've graduated, they join the education service. They become school teachers. And that brings us to theorem 1.1 of today. Good students become good teachers. We should train our students well. After we've trained them well, they will go to the education service, they will contribute good teachers. And being good teachers, they will train the school students. And at the end of the day, the school students, eventually, they will take their A-levels, they will clear it, they come to the university. We are going to teach them again. And this brings us to theorem 1.2 that says that better trained teachers provide better prepared students, we have a better time teaching the students, and then after that, we we become, we train them to become good teachers and better teachers, and then this is how we move forward for our education development. So this is what I perceive as the education ecosystem in Singapore. So what do I do? So now I'm going to illustrate by some of the strategies and ideas that I actually carry out to do all this. Now mathematics is actually an abstract subject. So this is what I call, we teach, we learn, and we lead by example. So what do I mean by this? Firstly, mathematics is abstract. 
it's very hard for students to fully comprehend this. So what we do is that we usually go by the bottom up approach in teaching. In research, we go top down. We prove the most general case, and then we deduce the, the examples as a special cases. But for teaching, it's very good to go for the, the bottom up approach where we actually go for the, uh, the simple cases first, and then we use to deduce the more advanced cases. We want to inculcate the idea about problem solving to the students. And this is what I call, we learn by examples. We let the student get a chance to solve problems. They will appreciate the methods better. And last but not least, we should lead by example. We should show students that we can do it. We can solve all these problems. And this is where, after all these years, I still insist of working out the examples live in front of the students. This is just like using the blackboard, the whiteboard, or the overhead projector. And the whole idea here is that this is the idea of imitation and practice. And this is a famous mathematician, George Poyer. He has a book that say, uh, that's entitled How to Solve It. And to him, so problem solving is like swimming. First, you see how people solve problem. You see how people swim. You imitate their swimming techniques, and then you start to swim yourself. Of course, you don't drown along the way. Okay? So this is one way of doing it. And as far as problem solving is concerned, what I would do is that instead of the, our usual structure of lectures and tutorial, two hours of three hours of lectures, one hour of tutorial a week, I will actually have three waves of problem. What do I mean by three waves? I have the usual way of the weekly tutorial problems. And what I will do is that I'll have some easier questions that correspond to the lecture examples. This will encourage the students to attempt the tutorial problems. Now, the problem that many of our colleagues find is that some of our students do not attempt the tutorial problems. This is to encourage them to do it. And at the end of the week, after they have learned all the foundation, I have the second week. I use the IBLE and I have what I call challenges of the week. This I will not discuss in the tutorial. Instead, I will mount the solution one week later, the outline of the solution, and this is for more advanced problems. And after this, after a few weeks, at the end of the entire chapter of materials, here comes the third wave. And this is what I call the extra problem set. And this is one for each chapter, and this is where you consolidate your knowledge. And because of the structure of the students, of having different aptitudes, so we should go for multiple level of understanding. Different students will see things from a different point of view. So in this case, one size doesn't fit all. As much as we hope that you know, the, what we've designed, it can benefit all students, we have to take into account of their different aptitudes. So that's why the lecture materials, the tutorial problems, I will make sure that there's something for everybody so that they can actually appreciate. If you're a good student, you can learn more. At the end of the day, in terms of assessment, I'll make sure that we can distinguish students of different levels of understanding. And sometimes it really helps to connect knowledge with real life situation as well. Now, it may not be something very fanciful. Like for example, I visited the supermarket over the weekend. Ah, supermarket. I'm sure you have been to this particular supermarket. Now, if you go to the supermarket and you look at the drinks, there are all kinds of drinks stock. That's this size. Now, this size, if you actually bother to measure these kind of drinks, you'll find that the size is actually the volume is 330 mils, the radius is 3.2 cm, the height is 10.8 cm. So the question is this, I want to hold a volume of 330 milliliters of liquid. I have to convey this to the consumer, I have to wrap it up into this thin. This thing costs money. Yeah, the top part, the bottom part, the side, all this. You need, to, you, you need money to create all this. And the question is that to do all this, am I using the material in the optimal way? This is an optimization problem. Now, if you look hard in the supermarket, if you spend a little bit more time in the supermarket, then you realize that there's another size. What is the other side? This one. 
This is a smaller size and it's taller and, and this is the other type of drinks you have in the supermarket. And if you do that, then the volume is 240 mil. And then this is the radius and the height. So the question is this, which company actually uses the material in a more optimal way? Now that one, I'll leave you to go back and work it out yourself. <laughs> this is the calculus optimization problem, active learners, okay? And of course, as you can see, it's nice to generate interest, it's to sustain interest. Now, the way I look at it is that giving a talk is like watching a movie. You capture the attention of the audience for two hours, or one hour, or even 30 minutes. That is not challenging. But teaching a course is not like watching a movie. Teaching a course is like producing a TV serial. You need to have cliffhanger, you need to bring back the audience every time, or else after a while, you notice that your lecture theatre get lesser and lesser of students, lesser and lesser number of students as time progresses. You need to bring back the audience. So, what should you do? Sometimes the use of enrichment material is very useful. They say that an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but an enrichment topic per lecture keeps the audience there. And I will illustrate to you now some of the enrichment materials we have. For example, you can talk about historical perspective of certain results. And this is about the result of L'Hopital rule. And this is about how L'Hopital invented, so-called invented L'Hopital rule, where he actually did not, and it was invented by Bernoulli. So you can show the story about Bernoulli. You can use video clips. Now, this is something that is very hard for our students. Limits f of x, limit as x goes to x0, f of x equals to l. What does this mean? Now, this simply means that fx approaches l. Now, the idea about approaching is very hard for students to understand, especially after the A-levels. So what we can do is that you can build on their intuition, you can show some video clip. Like for example, <laughs> approaching means the impression of where you are heading. If you ever take a roller coaster, you know where you are heading you know that you are in the bad position, okay? You don't want to be there anymore. So, and you can make use of IT resources. Nowadays, due to the advancement in technology, there are now many IT resources, like for example, this derivative, you can always use applets to illustrate and to see what you can do. Many textbooks has all these resources and also in the internet. And mathematical software, for example, Maple, is one software that we can use. There's this mysterious number called E, which is 2.718, blah, blah, blah. And when you teach this, there are other things you can do. You can define E as the limit of a sequence, one of the concepts that students find hard to visualize. And then you can teach E as the limit of a series. Then how do you illustrate this? So let's say if you take this as the limit of a sequence, and you notice that when n's get very, very large, you should get this number. So you can use maple to run from n from 991 to 1000. So n equals to 1000, and then the computer can get this. And you notice that this is not very close to the answer, but it's getting close enough. But if you treat this as a limit of a series, you just need to go from n from 1 to 12, and you get this, which is very close to the answer. So if you compare these two, then students will understand A, what is the meaning of the limit of a sequence, B, the limit of a series, and this inspired them to think about the rates of convergence of this. So these are some things that you can illustrate by using software. You can also visualize two-dimensional surfaces. In the old days, I used to build my paper props, and then the wind blows and the props <laughs> fell onto the ground, and students reflected it in the student feedback. <laughs> so, <laughs> So now you can use software. You can visualize this cone, circular cone. You can turn it up, look down at the side, and all this is possible due to the advancement of technology. And of course, if you do research, and if it happened, like me, I'm very fortunate that I happen to work in an area of mathematics that lies in the boundary of pure math, applied math, and engineering, then you can actually use this to get many ideas about what you can do inspire students about the usefulness of mathematics. 
So I get ideas for my lectures, for my research supervision and outreach activities. So let me show this example that our engineering colleagues may be very interested in. TDOA and FDOA estimation. Now you have an emitter, it can be a handphone, you try to call somebody. There are three receivers and by the time the signal reaches the other side, then there's a time delay. There's a frequency delay and this is what they call time and difference of arrival of the signal. And based on this information, you can zoom in and identify where is the location of the emitter. And how can this be done? It is actually based on computing the maximum of what I call the cross ambiguity function, which is this function here. So in other words, I want to find this point. How to find this point? There are many methods available in the engineering literature that you can do this. And uh, while I was teaching a course, in the engineering faculty or the engineering science program which is supposed to integrate science with engineering I was working on this problem so the solution turns out to be first I need to represent this cross ambiguity function in terms of a series expansion then based on the explicit expression for the series expansion we compute the partial derivatives to get the maximum and when I show this to the students in the engineering science program, they were very inspired because in that course of advanced calculus, I was precisely teaching them series expansion in the first part, followed by finding maximum through partial derivative. So you can look around and you can find ideas to inspire your students. And whether it is technological advances, new software, to me, this is just hardware and software. At the end of the day, Teaching is about human interaction. Otherwise, at the end of the day, this is just like distance learning. Okay? You have to interact with the student. So I would like to say that this is from hardware and software to what I call hardware. Hardware means we should interact with the student. There are opportunities to do that. This is something that I like very much to do during the lecture break. I have meet the people sessions. I will walk around the lecture theatre, I will talk to the students. Maybe initially they just, you know, hello, have you had a lunch, things like that. But after a while, they will open up, they will ask me more about other topics and things like that. This is one way of doing things. And after the class, I will hang around and then I can help the weaker students, I can motivate the better ones. And I always open my door for them, for consultation hours, anytime, all the time you'll find that the most rewarding part of teaching is actually the hardware, the hardware. And of course, in my capacity, uh, due to my multidisciplinary background research, uh, I can actually participate in new multidisciplinary programs like the engineering science program between science and engineering. I can coordinate outreach activities as assistant head of the department and I'll promote teaching excellence as chair of the DTEC. And just to say a few words about outreach activities, very often I will give outreach talks or workshop to the schools and junior college. It can be something that they write in and they invite me or they come and visit the department. This can be something, a small size talk about 30 students, students who are very motivated, very strong, or it can be a big assembly talk of 800 students. Frankly speaking, I've never spoken to 800 students before until I went down to the school for assembly talk. And the idea here is that in many students' mind, mathematics is just a very routine topic. You need to inspire them about mathematics is actually beautiful, it's actually relevant. And what I'll do is that I'll usually emphasize on the impact of mathematics to science, to society, and to technology. And to finish up, so here are some personal reflections. 15 years have gone by since I stepped into NUS to pursue my dream. So my conclusion is that I tried. I really tried. And I'll, I will continue to try to inspire students and to bring out the potential of both good and weak students. Now, I do not believe that we should eliminate the weaker students. We should help them we should bring out their full potential because ultimately all students deserve to be inspired. And I play appropriate roles for students 
at different parts of their learning. Like if I'm assigned to teach a first year's course, it's okay to me, I'm just one of the pieces in the bigger puzzle of the students' learning. So to me, no job is too big, too small. From the technical point of view, I'm, I'm not an IT expert. 10 years ago, I do not know how to use the PowerPoint. Three years ago, I do not know how to use Maple. I learned from our colleagues and co-lecturers, and you can do this. You need not invent new IT resources. You can get it from the internet or from the textbook. And you can get ideas from your research to connect mathematics with application. So is it possible to keep the old school way of learning? Is it possible to combine the old school way with the modern advances? And I can confidently say that, yes, we can. Because the old school way and the modern technology may give you a new, different perspective about teaching. So let me just show you two pictures of two famous mathematicians. This is Poison. And Poison says that life is good for only two things, discovering mathematics and teaching <laughs> mathematics. And this is another mathematician and physicist. This is Newton. And Newton says that if I have been able to see further, it was because I stood on the shoulders of giants. I learned from this great man. And my conclusion about 15 years in NUS is that as an educator in the university, I stand on the shoulders of giants to experience the two good things in life, discovering mathematics <laughs> and teaching mathematics. Thank you very much.